Hi, Michael. How are you doing? Hi, Lydia. I'm doing very well. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, ticking good, along. Good, good. Very good. <laughs> good to hear it. And hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our webinar today. My name is Lydia Wilkinson. I'm being joined by Michael Darby today. Um, I'll give you a bit of background into my role initially. So I work in the Connected Technologies Business Unit. I am a business development associate, so I work closely with clients on projects and account management, making sure that we're ticking all the boxes necessary for your regulatory compliance needs. And I've been asked today to introduce Michael and help with the Q&A portion of this webinar. So I'm going to dive right into that now. So today's webinar is part one of a two part webinar series on the topic of using radio modules for connected devices. This webinar describes the radio modules and the regulatory approvals required for a radio module being placed on the market in North America and Europe. Uh, this is really important information for module manufacturers and anyone planning to use radio modules in their products. Um, so if you have questions at the end of this webinar, please feel free to raise them. That's what we're here for. And hopefully we can tick all the boxes for you today. Uh, our speaker is Michael Darby. I'm sure all of you are aware of him. He's our technical director at Element for our global uh, team of connected technology labs and certification bodies. Michael's been in the engineering and compliance industry for more than 36 years. Well done, Michael. <laughs> he started <laughs> his <laughs> yeah. he started his career with uh, a manufacturer getting their own products through EMC approvals uh, and then moved to work for commercial test labs in the fields of EMC and radio performance. Um, he then moved into regulatory compliance approvals, becoming a TCB and notified body. Uh, he supports Elements Labs now and customers from his office in the UK. Michael is a member of the TCB Council Board of Directors, the chairman of the modular committee who advised the FCC on radio module policies and the author of the European Guidance on Radio Modules for the Radio Equipment Directive. So when I chat to people about Michael, I say what he doesn't know isn't worth knowing. <laughs> he is the radio oracle and a joy to work with. Just buttering you up there, Michael. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so I hope you all enjoy the webinar today and I will let Michael kick things off. Very good. Thank you very much, Lydia. Well, I'm an engineer, so flattery gets you everywhere. Um, <laughs> just tell us nice stuff and we'll do anything. Uh, yes. So thank you very much. Um, I will now share my slides. OK, so hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. So uh, this is part one of a two part webinar series on radio modules. And this webinar focuses on the module itself. So the primary aud audience really being the module manufacturer. This is important and useful information to anybody installing a module so that you know what you're getting. So uh, as Lydia said, my name is Michael Darby, technical director here at Element. Now, I apologise, I am an engineer, but I've, as much as possible, I've kept as much of the uh, equations and standards and things like that and the numbers out of this presentation. Most of my role these days is uh, solving people's problems and uh, communicating. So uh, that's what I hope to try and do in this webinar. So the goals for today then, um, talk about the reasons why we even have radio modules, understanding what a module is, looking at the test and authorization or test and compliance of radio modules uh, to a point that we can then hand over to the installer at the end of it. Um, we're going to focus on two main global trade regions, so North America, meaning the USA and Canada, and Europe meaning European Union and uh, a quick mention to Great Britain as well. And really, of course, uh, this is all about trade. It's all about being able to sell a product uh, for this webinar. It's all about being able to sell the module, um, but ultimately it's about being able to sell the product that the radio module goes into. So I've used the word test and compliance already in this webinar, if you spotted it a moment ago. Um, so I've talked about testing and approvals, and I say those in one sentence uh, as if it's the same thing, but it really isn't exactly the same thing. Testing, 
and approvals. They're two parts to the same conversation, really. Uh, it's very important to understand that they are very different things and probably never more so than in the topic of radio modules. In this webinar and in part two, we'll really explore the fact that you can have a product which you've tested but is not yet compliant. And then you can also have a product which appears to be approved, but um, you still need to do some testing on it. So uh, testing um, and approvals, two different things, uh, slightly linked. So some common equipment types to help you understand uh, what I'm talking about here, non-radio equipment. So this would be something like my laptop here. It looks like an electronic device, it looks like a computer. And then I've got monitors either side of me. In the next room, there's a printer. So this is like electronic equipment. And we've often historically referred to those as non-radio equipment. Then separately, we would talk about radio equipment. So like a walkie talkie or some sort of handheld radio or a broadcast station, something that transmits or receive. And we've always known that as radio equipment. But that's not the real world anymore. The real world is that we want equipment which is an electronic device with radio capability into it. So it's not non-radio, but it doesn't actually look like a radio. So my laptop is a radio equipment. It's got Wi-Fi in it, it's got Bluetooth in it, but it just looks like a computer. Actually, my printer in the next room also has Wi-Fi and I think RFID in it. So again, it's an electronic device, but it's not non-radio because it does actually have radio in it. And that's that's the reality of these days. My kitchen, my washing machine and my fridge freezer also have uh, radio inside them. So why do I always talk about radio modules? Well, what's the big deal with radio modules? Well, as we've just seen, it is a wireless world. And people want their products to be wirelessly connected, whether it's um, kitchen appliances, power tools, cars, office equipment, IT equipment, uh, medical equipment. We want those devices to have some sort of wireless connectivity. Uh, we might use the term the Internet of Things or machine to machine, but the ultimate reality is that we have people who make products. And they are the experts at making those products. And now suddenly we well, want those products to be wirelessly connected. They may not be experts, however, um, at wireless technology. So this is a challenge for our industry. How would you connect a device wirelessly um, without hiring a massive uh, radio engineering team into your company? Well, the solution, of course, is that you have some companies who make the wireless radio parts such as modules, um, and they are specifically making these radio parts and then selling them almost as components, if you like, to the manufacturers of the thing that is going to be wirelessly connected. And voila, a wirelessly connected end product. Perfect. So let's start off uh, with the USA and Canada. So the USA and Canada, there's two regulatory authorities. There's uh, the FCC in the USA and there's ICED Canada up in Canada. And they have very clear test and authorization procedures in place. Um, there are some flexibilities, there are some risks, there are some decisions and choices to be made. But for the most part, the authorization process is pretty clear. Um, we can loosely uh, split the types of equipment into unintentional radiators, which is the electronics part of a device or the radio receiver, the digital device part. And then there's the intentional radiator, like a transmitter, basically. And, and transmitters are loosely split into unlicensed transmitters and licensed transmitters. An unlicensed transmitter being something that you can walk around and transmit anywhere, like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, RFID. A licensed transmitter being something you can't transmit unless you have a license, uh, such as a, a base station, uh, a microwave link, um, a theater, wireless microphone or a mobile phone. And you might think you can transmit your mobile phone or your uh, wireless WAN connected tablet anywhere you like, but you can't. You're under complete control of the base station. Now, why do I mention this and the topic of modules? Well, it, it's really important to remind you and hopefully you understand that for the FCC in Canada, 
the individual parts of the product get authorized separately. So, for example, my laptop, there'll be a, probably an SDOC procedure or a certification for the electronics. And then there'll be a certification on the wireless LAN part. And then there'll be a certification on the Bluetooth part. It might all look like one authorized product, but you could go through and find that those separate parts have been authorized. So the transmitter parts will have been certified, but the electronics part may have just uh, been authorized under the SDOC procedure. All of those mandate testing, by the way, but the procedures for authorization are slightly different. So two authorization routes really exist. Suppliers declaration of conformity, which applies to pretty much the electronics or the digital devices and some types of radio receiver. And then the certification, which is pretty much applicable to almost all transmitter types. There are some types of transmitter that allow SDOC, but for the most part, all the kind of Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, RFID, all the common stuff, that all requires product certification. So if you had an electronic device with Wi-Fi in it, the electronics might be SDOC authorized, but the transmitter part would require a certification. So, the scope of assessment, what kind of testing do you have to do with the FCC in Canada? Well, RF exposure safety. So this isn't product safety, this is RF exposure safety. EMC emissions, not EMC immunity, and radio transmitter performance. So uh, not radio receiver performance yet. So RF exposure safety, this is the effects on the human body um, due to non-ionizing radiation or heating from the RF. EMC emissions, this is, is it going to interfere with something else? And transmitter performance, is it going to interfere with something else? And is it going to transmit and play in its correct lane, correct power, correct timing, things like that. And the radio equipment is fully tested and approved to um, published standards or published test methods. And there's a very clear one way of doing it that you must follow. So the certification authorization procedure, I'm not going to talk too much about SDOC because that doesn't apply to radio modules, as we'll come into in a moment. But the certification authorization procedure requires the manufacturer to test the correct way to the correct standards, maintain all their technical documentation, and then submit it to the certification body. In the USA, that's known as a TCB. In Canada, it's known as a CB or an FCB. And the certification body's role is not to make interpretations or judgments, but it is to check that the manufacturer and their chosen test lab have done everything correctly as defined in the standards and in the rules. And when a product um, has had its transmitter section certified, then that product will have a certification number and the certification number will relate to the transmitter section of that product. So, for example, a manufacturer of a device with a transmitter in it goes to get a certification. They have to upload all the details of that product, but the main focus is on the transmitter part because that's the reason for the certification. They'll end up creating an FCC ID and an IC certification number. And these don't just mean it passed there's some tests. It's specifically these are the results. This is the output power level. This is the schematic diagram. Here's the parts list. A full traceable legal reference number to the certification file held on uh, on record by the FCC and I said Canada. So then that certification number ends up going on the product which has had the certification. Simple. So you can imagine then that multiple authorizations easily apply to a single product. Um, my laptop has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, so effectively two certification types. My mobile phone has licensed transmitters, unlicensed transmitters, multiple different frequency bands. There's lots of different FCC grants or equipment classes appropriate to it. And those types of products are probably going to have an SDOC for the electronics or any radio receivers that are inside it. So 
unlicensed transmitters, such as the sort of comm stuff we have around our house, the transmitter section must be certified and the antenna is part of the certification. The transmitter must be tested with the antenna uh, and the antenna must be perfectly described. So the construction, the gain, the radiation pattern, the layout, everything must be defined in the certification application. And if anybody at any point wishes to change the antenna to a different type, then the certification of the transmitter must be updated. For licensed transmitters, those can be certified without the antenna. The transmitter hardware itself can be certified and the antenna doesn't necessarily need to be part of the certification, although there are some limitations on, on power levels and RF exposure and things. The exception to this would be licensed radio modules because radio modules don't actually appear anywhere in the licensed sections of the FCC rules. The FCC rules actually only allow for unlicensed transmitters. You might be thinking, well, that's strange. I've seen lots of licensed cellular modules and, and that's simply because the FCC have created a policy through one of their guidance documents to allow licensed transmitters to get a modular approval. And one of the requirements or one of the uh, conditions of that is that if you have a cellular user equipment or end user, you know, um, client device, if you like, radio module, it must be treated in the same way as a part 15 transmitter with regard to the antenna. So that's why we can have licensed cellular radio modules, but the antenna must be clearly described and defined in the application for certification, just as it is with part 15. So testing of radio equipment then um, for, for certification, there'll be all the EMC emissions that come from the transmitter. There'll be the transmitter performance tests. This is typically a, a mixture of radiated and conducted test cases. And the transmitter manufacturer is expected to define an RF exposure category for their product. So they would define their product as being portable, which means it's within 20 centimeters of the body, or mobile, which means it's more than 20 centimeters of the body. Now, some products are pretty simple with that. A mobile phone is clearly a portable device. It's used next to the body. A laptop is clearly a portable device. The clue is in the name, LAP. A mobile device would be something like a wireless LAN router or that printer or washing machine where, of course, I could touch it occasionally, but for the most part, it's more than 20 centimetres from the body in normal use. So the manufacturer of a product for certification is expected to define that at the certification stage uh, and then that gets listed on the grant. So you can see then that Transmitter certification is really a holistic mix of engineering um, and law, uh, you know, regulatory approvals and test results. So it's not just about getting the right tests done. It's all about the correct procedure and process for certification. So what about radio modules then? How do they fit in within this radio certification? And why, why do you, would you even get a radio module certified if it's then going to go into some other product? Well, the simple fact is, if you get a radio product certified with the FCC or Canada, and that end product has a test and a certification as a radio product, and then you permanently install that product into something else, you've modified it beyond recognition, and of course, the certification is lost. So if I took my wireless router and I put it inside my printer, my wireless router is no longer certified because it's not a router anymore. It's a wirelessly connected printer now, which is a completely different product. If I took my mobile phone and I permanently installed it into a medical device and then put the medical device on the market, well, the phone certification is gone because it's not a phone anymore. It's a medical device with wireless connectivity. So the general process is that radios installed into other things lose their certification. Of course, it's pretty obvious that applies around the world. But in the USA and Canada, there is a thing known as a modular approval. And if the radio gets a special type of certification known as a modular approval certification, it gives that radio superpowers. 
and the radio's superpower is that you can install it into something else and it will keep its certification. So if you've got a radio module which has been certified as a module approval and you have put it into something else, it breaks that standard statement about losing its certification and it can remain certified. And the certification number, those reference numbers that I talked about, they would apply to the radio module that gets certified and then the module can keep its certification number even when it's installed in the host. So you can imagine then if you've got a laptop like this where the electronics are SDOC and the transmitter section needs to be certified, that could be certified by certifying the transmitter section of the laptop, or it could be that a radio module was put inside it and the module kept its certification um, even after it was put in the laptop. So, I've used the word radio module countless times. I, I've lost track of the number of times that I've said it, even in the last uh, 15 minutes of a webinar. So what is a radio module? Is this a radio module? Well, probably if I was to give, come around to all of your offices right now um, with a pad of paper and some coloring crayons and ask you to draw a radio module, you might have come up with something that looked a bit like this. You would have drawn a little square or a rectangle um, and you would have put some components on it um, and you'd be looking at this screen now going, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much what I drew. It's a it's a separate piece of circuit board that you could imagine holding in your hand, um, but it's not a final product. It's clearly intended to be installed into something else. We can see a little rectangle of metal over a section of it. We can see some antenna connectors or or maybe some little pads underneath for soldering. And, uh, and so, yeah, it looks like a piece of circuit board that's intended to be installed into something else. What about these? Do these look like radio modules? Well, probably none of your drawings would have looked like this. Maybe the USB dongles could be, but certainly the wireless routers and the mobile phone, you say, well, that doesn't look like a module, but I don't know if it can't be. So let's find out. So this webinar then is looking at life um, through the eyes of the module manufacturer so that we're looking at the module approval itself. And this will figure out what a modular approval gives to you, how the module manufacturer should proceed and, and what it gives you at the end of the day. So the whole purpose of modular approvals is to reduce the certification effort. So let's say, for example, you had a radio module manufacturer um, and they sold 100 modules to 100 different manufacturers and those manufacturers installed them into their products, their, their laptops, their printers, um, uh, their washing machines and their medical devices um, and car infotainment systems. And those manufacturers of those end products all went off to the FCC in Canada to get their certifications. They would all have to certify the transmitter sections of their products. So suddenly you'd have 100 different products all asking the FCC and Canada for certification and they'd all have the exact same output power, the exact same parts list, the exact same schematics. So that's really a, a duplication of effort there. And, and so it might just be simpler to certify the transmitter section um, ahead of time and then the end product just installs that. So, so it's all about reducing the certification effort. Now, when the FCC in Canada uh, instigated the modular approval rules, there was an acknowledgement that some of the test results from the module might be applicable to the end final product. Now, it doesn't mean you can just plug it in and forget it. The end product still needs to pass those tests, but um, there was an acceptance that some of the results from the module uh, could be OK into the end product. And obviously that's going to be a big topic of next week's part two webinar. So modular approval then is for a piece of radio equipment which can meet a certain set of requirements and is for use to being installed into other equipment. So there are some main types of modular approval. There's full modular approval or sometimes known as single modular approval. And this is a fully approved module that's going to be used in any kind of host and the module manufacturer doesn't know which host it's going to go into. 
or there's limited modular approval. And this is a module which doesn't quite meet all of the modular approval requirements. So something's missing, but that's OK because the module manufacturer knows the host it's going to go into and is able to control that it definitely will go into that host or that any host it goes into, the module manufacturer has the controls in place to make sure that whatever the limitation was, they fix it. In all of those cases, it's the radio module that gets the certification and the module is labelled with the FCC ID and the IC number. So what are the requirements for modular approval? Well, um, let's look at the FCC's requirements first. There are eight criteria for getting modular approval. They're listed in 15.212 of the rules, which, as I mentioned, is an unlicensed rule section. So firstly, the transmitter must have a shield over its transmitter components. Obviously not over the antenna, uh, but the shielding must go over the, uh, the transmitter components, all around it, in fact. So typically when you look at a, a module board, it has a shield over the top. Now you can't always see, but there's a ground plane within the module which acts as the, the shield around the bottom part. There's nothing in the FCC rules that define the shielding quality or the shielding capabilities, so um, we often assume that it has to be metal, but there's nothing uh, written to mandate that. Um, and it's often assumed to be some sort of external soldered on shield. But if the transmitter section has its own uh, shielding some other way, then uh, the manufacturer just has to demonstrate how they meet that. The purpose of the shield is to make sure that signals don't couple off of the module onto the host, of course, is everyone's obvious assumption. But it's also to check that signals from the host don't couple onto the module and affect the transmitter performance. It must have buffered modulation data inputs. This seems like a bit of a waste of time with modern digital uh, modulations, but imagine when the rules were written and you had FM and AM modulation types and the module uh, manufacturers tested it at one sort of FM or AM range and then somebody comes and overdrives it. And that's why you'd need a buffered modulation data input. Really, it's basically saying the installer mustn't be able to drive the modulation in a way that's beyond how the module manufacturer tested it. It must have a power supply regulation. Uh, typically, that's going to be a hardware solution on, on the circuit board, but um, you know it, it's not defined that it has to be that way. Um, and it's so that when you install the module into any host, regardless of the power supply that goes to the module, the end transmitter section will always see the same value. The module must meet the part 15 antenna requirements, so it must have a unique or dedicated or integral antenna, or at the very least, the antenna must be clearly defined and described in the filing. And of course, it must have been tested with the uh, module. The module must be tested standalone, so the module must be tested outside of the host. And it, of course, it must be possible. You couldn't have a big circuit board of a product and say, can I just certify, can I get a modular approval on this corner of the board? It must be a separate removable item. Now, the ideal for testing a module is to test it on the end of a long piece of ribbon cable, at least 10 centimetres long. Um, and that way, all sides of the module are exposed. But more and more people test them actually on a test jig. And that's OK, as long as the manufacturer can um, provide confidence that their test jig didn't affect the testing of the module. The module itself has to be labelled, in this case with the FCC ID. It must meet its own rule part. Now, what I mean by that, of course, is if you've got a Bluetooth module, it must meet the module approval requirements, but it also has to meet the Bluetooth requirements. And the module requires an RF exposure assessment. All modules require that. And the list for Canada is all very similar. In fact, I uh, put them here, but you can see, apart from the fact that it needs to have an ICIC number instead of an SCC ID, it's all very, very similar. So modular approval is a legal thing, not just an engineering thing. You, a manufacturer of a module could try and justify why they f still want full modular approval, even though it doesn't have a shield or a regulator or a, um, uh, they didn't test it standalone. And I could sit here and come up with 
good engineering answers of why they're needed. The reality is, though, the rules say if you want module approval, you've got to meet all those requirements. So when a module manufacturer goes for test and certification, they'll get their module fully tested as if it was a radio product tested on its own. Um, it has to be tested or the radiator test cases in at least three orientations because we don't know what orientation the module will be in. So you don't just test it flat on the table. It has to be in at least three orientations um, like a small handheld device would be. Uh, and uh, then the application for certification, there has to be a cover letter from the manufacturer to explain to the TCB how they meet those eight important criteria and to the CB or FCB for Canada. If you've got limited modular approval, well, the letter needs to clearly describe that as well. It needs to state what the limitation is um, and limited module approval is specific for a host and the application must demonstrate how they maintain compliance in that host. Now, be aware that every application for limited modular approval certification has to also involve the FCC through something known as the pre-approval guidance or PAG um, procedure. So which of the eight criteria could you miss and get a limited modular approval? Well, it's any of these five. So if you had a module without a shield or without a data buffer or without a power supply regulator or it needed a professional installation of the antenna or you couldn't test it standalone if you met one or more of the uh, sorry if you failed to meet one or more of these you could get a limited modular approval and you'd have to demonstrate how you get around it those final three are, are non-negotiable every module must have the labeling um, it must meet its own rule part and it must have an RF exposure assessment. So with regard to limited module approval, then the module certification file must list the host or series of hosts and the conditions for that module and how the module manufacturer ensures that it will remain compliant in every host. The installation guide needs to be really clear uh, of how they guarantee it, but it's not just a case of giving some instructions to the installer because the module manufacturer remains responsible. And so it's pretty clear that the module installation instructions must contain a lot of uh, detail. There is such a thing as a split modular approval. Now, if you look on the FCC website, you won't see very many of them, um, but uh, I think they're going to become much more popular in the future. The concept of a split module is that not everything about it is in one place. Uh, it, as the name suggests, it's split over two locations. Um, and um, in fact, at the moment, split module approvals is not permitted for licensed modules. Um, but when we think about 5G FR2, where you'd have an active antenna, which is really part of the module, a uh, part of the transmitter, but it's not on the module board, then you've really got a split situation. And so um, the plan is to incorporate uh, split modules into the, uh, to allow licensed split modules. And then we'll start seeing a few more of those in the future. So with regard to all modular approvals, then. The module is fully tested to the applicable FCC rule part and the Canadian standard, and also those modular approval requirements of having a good antenna, being tested standalone, tested in all orientations, things like that. The radio module gets a certification, so it's not just a transmitter certification, it's a modular approval as well. The FCC ID and IC number relate to the module. Now, certification is an optional step in the USA. The radio module manufacturers could just sell the modules without certification directly to the installer company and say, here's a module, it's not tested or certified, you can install it into your product and then you can go and test and certify your end product. Or alternatively, we have this module which we have tested and certified. Of course, it's a bit more money, but here it is. So it, it's a choice. It's an industry choice thing um, whether you want to buy a certified module or not. Obviously, a certified module gives you the benefit that when you install it, it's already certified. So 
the manufacturer must provide clear instructions to the installer. This is a very important thing. As a TCB, when I'm reviewing a radio module for certification, you know, the test report is important, but probably the installation instructions is the most important document in a module approval. The antenna type must be clearly defined. And if it's a solder down module, the path from the antenna pad to the antenna itself must be clearly defined. Uh, the width of the track, the angles of the turns, everything. Um, and if any of those things change, of course, that's like changing into a new antenna type and the certification will need to be updated. Manufacturer of the module needs to define the RF exposure conditions that they assess their module under. And uh, they should provide details on the legal and technical responsibilities um, for retesting the host when the module is installed. This is something which a lot of module manufacturers don't do a great job of. They, they typically try and meet the minimum requirements and then really don't always give lots of advice on what exactly you should do. So in part two of this webinar series, we'll, we'll talk about the, the extra testing that the installer needs to do uh, or should do. Um, and, um, uh, and it would be quite convenient if all that sort of level of detail was in the module installation instructions. So it's not meant to be just a technical connection instruction for us as a certification body and for the FCC in Canada. They want to see that clear advice to the installer. And the FCC have a guidance document, KDB 996369D03, which describes what should be in the radio modules user manual. Because when you think about it, you can have people on this call who install modules. So you'll learn all of this and you've probably learned it from me before and you'll learn it from other TCB and notified bodies. But what about all those manufacturers who don't go out and learn this? How are they going to know what to do? Well, the only way they can find out is by reading the installation instruction from the module manufacturer. And the module manufacturer must know what they're doing because they've been through the certification process. So RF exposure then. Most modules end up being certified as mobile because the module manufacturer doesn't know the product that it's going to go into. So how can they define if it's mobile or portable? It's very difficult, difficult. Well, mobile devices, that's quite an easy thing to assess, often done as a calculation with a half a page of text and a calculator, whereas a portable assessment is often a little trickier unless the output power is so low that the you could say, right, well, it's below the SAR test threshold anyway. So regardless if um, regardless if uh, it was held right next to the body, it still wouldn't require a SAR test. It is actually possible to do a SAR test on a radio module. And if the SAR value is low enough, such as below 0.4 watts per kilogram, then it could be certified as a portable device. You still need to do some SAR testing when you install it, but it could still maintain its portable certification. So if the power is really low or you've done a SAR test on the module, you could assess it as portable. Um, but in the most cases, module manufacturers authorize them as mobile. So as a module manufacturer then, you should be uh, in good conversation with your TCB to ensure that you don't have unwanted grant notes on your FCC grant. Uh, historically, there were some quite unhelpful comments. You know, one of them would be, and this was standard text, I think, uh, that all TCBs used, um, but the statements used to say, you know, must not be co-located with other transmitters. Well, it's a pretty fierce statement, must not be co-located. People have contacted me and said, I can't use this module because it says it must not be co-located. Well, that's not what it means. It, it really means that the module manufacturer couldn't assess it with other transmitters because they didn't know what other transmitters you were going to use. So it hasn't been assessed for use next to other transmitters. So as an installer, as part of your retesting of the radio, you would end up considering all the other transmitters as well. So a more useful grant note from the module manufacturer on their grant would be um, you know, making sure the installer uses FCC test procedures for multiple transmitters. So not just putting use of multiple transmitter test procedures on the grant, because if the installer doesn't understand what they are, how are they going to know what to do? So the grant should state that, but then the installation instructions should clearly describe 
what exactly those test procedures are. Another common confusing grant note is um, must be more than 20 centimetres from a person. Now again, people come to me and say, well, I've got this module, but I want to put it into uh, a device with a, a carrying strap, like a camera or something. Well, that's going to be next to a person. So I can't use this module. Well, the answer is you can, but the certification will need a change. So the, the better grant note would be to state this module has been authorised for mobile conditions. Um, and then, of course, the uh, installer, if you explain very clearly in your installation instructions, if you put it into a portable device, you need to get in touch with the module manufacturer so that the module certification can be changed. So, of course, there's still work to be done, but it's a difference between must not and if you want to do it, here's how you proceed. And really, as often as possible, for a module manufacturer, try and get mixed portable and mobile exposure conditions. So I've seen products where the output power is really low, like less than a milliwatt. So it wouldn't require a SAR test, but the module manufacturer was lazy and just went, oh, just done an MPE calculation. Or maybe they asked the test lab and the test lab went, oh, modules are always mobile, um, MPE calculation. And then the TCB sees the MPE calculation and so they write down authorised for mobile use and as they should. But the TCB could have reached out to the manufacturer and said, it's less than one milliwatt. Do you, do you not also want to include a portable justification? Because then the grant could say portable and mobile conditions, and suddenly your module can be used in many, many more types of hosts. So the more you can do at the module level, the more helpful it is for the installer. So the FCC grant um, and I said certificate it's a legal reference to the module itself. The module is the certified item. It doesn't guarantee that the module will continue to pass when it's in the host, and it doesn't guarantee that the host will pass with the module in it, but it does mean that anybody installing it may not need to recertify their product because the certification was handled at the module level. So when we look again at the types of equipment then, these unintentional radiators like IT part and receivers and the intentional radiators or the transmitters. When you're getting modular approval, the transmitter certification can be transferable to the host. But the IT equipment, the receivers, whether you use SDOC or certification, it doesn't matter, that part is not transferable to the host. Only the transmitter part is transferable. So should you test the part 15b or the ICES requirements, the, the electronics or the receivers, do you test those on a module? You don't need to. If the, in fact, if the module is only ever in, for installation into an end product, then no, don't test the electronics or the receivers because they must be tested and authorised at the end product stage. If that module could be used out of a host, then you would need to test the part 15 part or the IT and the receivers because, well, it could also, it could be a module or it could be used outside of a host. And you can probably all imagine uh, some manufacturers we can probably all think of who make a circuit board, kind of like a, an open source computer, and it could be used outside of a host or it could be used as a module. So they would need to test and authorise the receivers and the IT equipment, the uh, digital device part. But for most modules that are always going to be installed into a host, they don't require it. And the part 15 part is never transferable. You know, the, the non-transmitter sections are never transferable to the host anyway. So I mentioned KDBs. Here's a quick link to the FCC's Knowledge Database System, or KDB system. This is where you can search up guidance documents. So probably the most important KDBs for the FCC, uh, um, for radio module world, KDB 996369 is the most important. And then there's some there for labelling and RF exposure. So the FCC in Canada, are these radio modules? Yeah, I, I would say so. They look like little standalone bits of board intended to be installed in something else. They look like they've got shields over their transmitter sections. Their antenna ports look kind of unusual or unique. Uh, so, yeah, I think these are probably all 
radio modules in the scope of the FCC and Canadian requirements. Are these? No, no, these are end products, really. Those USB dongles possibly could be modules or could be used like modules or authorised as modules, but certainly, yeah, it's pretty unlikely, but certainly the routers and the phone are not. Quick mention about Canada then. Um, Canada and the, and the USA, they're not the same with regard to regulatory approvals. Canada has a list of FCC KDBs that they accept or that they acknowledge, and the modular one is not on their list. They have their own set of requirements. There's a completely different set of documentation. So when applying for certification, you don't just write out that cover letter for the FCC and hope it satisfies both. Separate set of letter for the uh, Canada certification, different wording, different forms and everything. Lic uh, radio modules appear in the unlicensed or license exempt and licensed for all parts in Canada. And, and all antenna descriptions are, of course, necessary for all product types. Some common mistakes by module manufacturers then for North America, uh, missing out the antenna descriptions, and not realizing just how detailed the antenna description needs to be. Lack of clear information to the installer. So the, the module manufacturer puts the most basic compliance statements in their installation instruction, Often I think module manufacturers, they want their module to look really useful. They want to say, buy our module and your life will be great. And then they don't want their installation instructions to then say, oh, by the way, you install it, but you still got to test, right? You understand that. And so the installation instructions are often a little bit loose and weak on that. And then the installer goes to the FCC or to a TCB and says, I've installed a module. I saw a webinar that said I still need to test, so I'm confused now. And then that upsets the FCC when they hear that. So improve the installation instructions. Um, the module manufacturer remains legally uh, responsible for the trans their own transmitter in the end product. So uh, make sure that they've taken all the necessary steps. And there's just still a lot of misinformation on this whole topic. So takeaways from this section. Um, there's a special type of radio certification that you can get on a module such that it can be kept in a host. It's certification doesn't just mean it passed, it will be fine. It's a specific reference to that thing. So the module certification, it will list the power, it will list the emissions, it will list the radio performance, and it will list all the details of that transmitter. It's a proper registration or certification process of the transmitter section and um, the installer still has obligations to make sure the end product passes the tests. Modules, even fully approved modules, are certified under specific grant conditions, such as only for mobile use at, um, at the time of certification. So a quick comment, Ben, about I've talked about regulatory approvals, which is like the legal mandatory requirement to place a product on the market. So for the FCC and ICED Canada, this is the legal mandatory thing that you have to go through. But there are also some industry requirements to be able to connect to different networks or to perhaps be able to put the Bluetooth logo on your product or the Wi-Fi alliance. And one of the most important ones that we see here at Element is for cellular industry, or the cellular radio modules. So in North America, any cellular equipment which hopes to connect to the networks needs to meet the PTCRB requirements. This isn't so much about um, regulatory interference. This is all about interoperability. It's often known as conformance te testing to ensure that the radio can operate correctly on the network. And then the individual carriers like the, the phone companies in the USA, they have their own specific carrier acceptance testing. So they would specifically ask for PTCRB testing and also their own specific carrier acceptance tests. Now, these are required for cellular devices, but they can be done at the modular level. So you can get a PTCRB approval and the carrier acceptance testing all done at the modular level and then when it gets installed into the host the reassessment testing is is quite limited uh, and we'll go over that obviously in part two all right so let's have a quick look then at europe 
um, and with a quick nod to Great Britain. So in Europe, we have the Radio Equipment Directive, known as the RED, uh, and it applies to anything with a transmitter, a receiver, or a transceiver in it of up to 3000 gigahertz. So the RED is a trade directive. It's not a technical document. You won't go through it and find details of tests or power levels or limits. The only technical thing really you'll find in the RED is in Article 3 of the RED, which says that the manufacturer must perform a technical assessment of their radio equipment before they can see e-mark it. There's only one authorization route in the RED, and that's declaration of conformity. There's no certification process in the RED, so radios are not certified. And the declaration of conformity by the manufacturer is per individual unit covering all the aspects of the product on the date that that unit is placed on the market. So if you're selling modules at a rate of 100 a day, then suddenly the requirements change and you're still selling that level of module or radio equipment or whatever, then you're going to need to reassess before your next back batch hits the market. There's no grandfathering of the rules. So um, the assessment scope under the red product safety, now that covers everything like electrical safety, all aspects of safety, RF exposure safety, EMC performance, that's EMC emissions and immunity, radio performance, that's the radio transmitter and the receiver. And then there's some other categories. So for example, um, right now, mobile phones would be assessed for emergency calling. Um, you know, the next requirement to come in will be for things like phones or tablets to have uh, a common type of charger connector. And then in August 2025, we accept, expect cyber security requirements to come in and they'll all be under Article 3.3. And the manufacturer assesses the product by applying standards and ideally uh, harmonised standards if their standards exist for their radio. So. What's a radio module in the scope of the red then? If we look into the red and, and try and find a definition of the radio module, does this fit? Do these fit? Well, let's have a look. So radio module requirements as viewed by the module manufacturer and what a CE marked radio module actually means. Well, modular approvals then in the EU. There's no such thing. There's no mention of modules anywhere in the red or any of the test standards or any of the information. There's really only one document that talks about radio modules for the RED, and that's a, a guidance note specific to radio modules. Right, I was the author of that document, and I was encouraged to remove the term radio module because it's a term that doesn't appear anywhere in European compliance. And I said, well, if I remove the term, nobody will know what the document is for, uh, because it's a, a common term used around the world. So modules are not mentioned in the red. Certification is not a compliance route for the red and radio equipment directive products are all placed on the market based on a DOC of the product you place on the market. So there'd be no certification of a module because there's no certification to transfer to a host. So why indeed do we ever see CE marked radio modules? What's the point? Well, firstly, the radio module manufacturer must CE mark the module to be able to place it on the market if the module meets the definition of radio equipment. Radio definition of radio equipment is that the um, radio could transmit or receive. If you took that radio and you put an antenna on it and you put a voltage to it and you fed a signal in or out of it, if it could transmit or receive, then it is radio equipment and it's in scope of the red. And a lot of module manufacturers say, well, Actually, yeah, that that applies to our module, so we must see e market to be allowed to sell it. There are other module manufacturers or chipset manufacturers that say, actually, no, our, ours is nowhere near a finished product, so uh, ours isn't a radio, actually. But um, even selling business to business is considered placing on the market. So if you have a module which you consider to be a radio product and you want to sell it to another company in the uh, European Union, then you need to CE mark it. So radio modules, therefore, they're, they're just CE marked just the same as any other radio equipment to allow the module to be sold. However, that's not that's the legal reason, but that's not actually the reason why we have CE marked radio modules. The real reason is that market demand drives it. Market 
installers want to buy a CE marked radio module um, because they think they need it, but also because it gives them the confidence. They they know that it's been through the tests, they know that it's passed the tests, um, and that they know therefore it's a module that can meet the tests again under the right set of circumstances. So the module manufacturer should be assessing the module for its intended environment. That's what the radio equipment directive says that radio equipment manufacturers should assess the module for its intended environment. Well, that's fine, but the module manufacturer doesn't know the intended environment. So in most cases, as with the FCC, the module is just tested on the end of a cable or the end of a test jig. So the module gets CE marked for sitting on a test jig effectively. The module manufacturer must fully test the module, even though you know it's going to get retested in the host. You can't say, well, I won't test my module for safety or EMC because I know it will get fully retested for that. If you want to sell the CE module, uh, if you want to sell the radio module with a CE mark on it, you've got to remember it's radio equipment, so it has to fully comply with all the aspects of the red. So when it comes to testing the radio module, Product safety must be performed on the module, even though it's just a little 3.3 volt DC powered thing. It still needs a, a set of module testing, typically EN 62368, for example. RF exposure, well, you don't know the end installation, but an assessment is usually performed. So, for example, if it's less than 20 milliwatts, then you could easily say, uh, that a SAR assessment would not be necessary and you can easily demonstrate um, compliance at, at greater distances. But if the power is more than 20 milliwatts, you could perform calculations to demonstrate what sort of distance it could be used at. EMC performance must be tested on the module. Now, um, there's a lot of the EMC tests you wouldn't want to do. You wouldn't want to do ESD directly to the bare board of a module. You could do the horizontal coupling plane and the vertical coupling plane. And of course, you could do the radiated immunity test. Some module manufacturers will put long cables on their test jig and do the fast transients and conducted tests and others don't. There's no rules um, really as such other than the manufacturer's own risk assessment used to decide which tests apply to their radio. Radio performance testing, of course, must be performed. This is pretty simple, actually transmitter and receiver performance tests can be done on a module just as they are with any other type of radio. And cybersecurity, well, will cybersecurity apply to a module? Remember, there is no such thing as a module, it's a radio equipment. So you have to decide the intended use of your radio module. Now, if your module is a cellular module for intending to connect to the internet, then you've probably already got your answer. If your module is something like Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, you can't ask our Bluetooth or Wi-Fi in scope of the cybersecurity requirements because that's not even a valid question. It's not technology specific, it's product specific. So the module manufacturer has a challenge now to decide, do we assess our product our products for cybersecurity based on assuming that they will be used for connection to the internet, or do we not assess them for cybersecurity and then anybody who does use them um, to connect to the internet, well, they'll have to fix that issue. It all comes down to the module manufacturer's risk assessment, which is the first document any manufacturer would open when they're planning their product. And it's where a manufacturer looks at all the standards available, looks at the tests available and decides which of these tests apply to me. So that's the chronology of the risk assessment in Europe. You open your risk assessment, you figure out which standards do I apply, which tests apply to my product, and then you go ahead and test them. So the module manufacturer, for example, with cybersecurity, will look at their radio equipment, their module, and decide, will it connect to the internet? Will it be used for data or personal information? Um, will it be used uh, by you know, childcare products? Um, will it ever be used for transactional security? And they might say, no, as a radio module, it isn't. Um, or they might say, yes, we know it will. So the module authorization then, the module will give a declaration of conformity by the module manufacturer. It should state all the accessories, software versions, antennas, things like that. The information to the installer should be very clear, but you know, 
nobody's checking the homework there and there's no in the same way there's no rules on module design or module quality but there's no certification so there's no certification body to police it so nobody's checking the installation instructions to see what kind of advice the module manufacturer is giving to their customer nobody cares if it's got a shield or a voltage regulator because it's just being assessed as a radio equipment even if you go to a notified body they're just a performing a technical assessment to Article 3.1, 3.2 and 3.3. Obviously, the notified body will read things like the label and the user manual and they'll they'll work with you, but they'll only prevent the certificate if it's a, a risk of non-compliance to Article 3. So the radio module will have a presumption of conformity if um, evidence of full compliance to the harmonised standards exist. Most uh, module manufacturers do want to get a notified bodies type examination certificate. Sometimes it's mandatory, but if harmonized standards are used for the radio and other parts, then it isn't. But often the module manufacturer will want a notified body certificate anyway. So the technical documentation of the module must exist as it would for any radio equipment. This is a little bit of a challenge for radio module manufacturers, of course, because the module's declaration of conformity is valid on the date that the module is placed on the market. And that's an easy job, actually, for the module manufacturer. You assess your module, you place that module on the market with its DOC. And then the next day, you put another version of the module on the market with its version of the DOC, and the same with its notified body certificate. But if you're selling modules for uh, the same module type, construction, whatever, for years, and the standard changes, the new versions of the module will hit the market with different standards on its DOC. But your customer may not have used their first batch of modules, and they might wish that they had got uh, their older modules had an updated DOC. There isn't really a process for updating a DOC of a product you've already placed on the market some time ago because the DOC applies at the point of putting on the market. I think that's one of the main reasons why most module DOCs are online documents. So what is a radio module in the scope of the red? These? No, these are just little radio equipment. In the same way, these are slightly bigger radio equipment. So I mentioned there's a, a useful guidance document, TGN01. There's a link to that document. And some final comments then on radio modules for Europe. The CE mark is a legal requirement for the module manufacturer. The module test results can be very important to the installer, and we'll go over that in part two. The CE mark of the module, in theory, should be less important to the installer because the CE mark is really just about being able to sell the module. But in reality, the uh, installer or the module manufacturer's customer does want to see the CE mark. Some module manufacturers do try and sell the module without the CE mark, and I think they do notice that their sales drop. So some common mistakes in Europe, uh, not making test reports available to the installer. That's quite important. We'll go over that in part two. Lack of information instructions to the installer keeping up with changes, whether your own company has changed a component in your module or if the test standard has changed or a new regulation has come in. And of course, lots of misinformation on this whole topic. So takeaway from this European section, there is no certification of the module because there's no certification in the red. The CE mark applies to the module. The module has been CE marked usually for sitting on a test jig and the DOC is the module manufacturer's statement that it did comply in that configuration. But good news, the CE marked module has fully passed all the tests and therefore um, has at least at some point demonstrated that it can be placed on the market and that it can pass those tests. So similar to North America, um, over in Europe, we have some industry requirements in addition to the regulatory. So the CE marking, or the UKCA marking, if you're using that for Great Britain, um, those are the legal mandatory requirements for placing on the market. But there are also some industry compliance requirements, uh, especially, for example, cellular equipment. So if we look at the cellular modules, 
In North America, we had the PTCRB. Well, in the rest of the world, we have the GCF, Global Certification Forum. Now, if the phone network or the phone carrier is a member of the GCF, then they will expect the radio to have GCF test and certification. Now, this is something that can be done on the module and can be kept when it's in the host. So that's good news. Um, in addition to the uh, GCF, there could be carrier acceptance testing by some of the carriers. But if the carrier or the phone network that you're selling to is a member of the GCF, then it's probably going to be that. And actually, there's quite an, an overlap between the GCF testing and the CE mark testing. In fact, some of your CE mark testing will come probably from your GCF test report. OK, so a final takeaway on radio modules, other than the fact that radio modules are going into all sorts of products. Authorised modules have been tested, they've passed the tests, um, and they're effectively, uh, a, therefore, a good solution. Uh, the module manufacturers mostly want to help. They, they all have uh, a desire to do a good job and a good product, and, and most good module manufacturers want to help the installer. And my top tip to module manufacturers is that installers are realizing that if they can find a good module manufacturer who will help them out, then that is a real value add. And, and so a lot of manufacturers hopefully are becoming aware that they could pay a little bit more for a module where the module manufacturer will support them. It's worth the money. So authorised modules are a great thing. Um, despite all these regulations and hurdles, they are a really good way to get our products connected. Um, but the whole topic is under a lot of scrutiny because obviously this is a situation where you've got two different manufacturers coming together to make an end product and it doesn't always get done right. So the, the more mistakes that get made, the greater scrutiny from the regulatory authorities and of course the, the greater chance of a product just not working correctly. But we'll go over that in a lot more detail in part two, I think, when we start talking about how to squeeze that little radio module into some other stuff. In the meantime, hopefully uh, component shortages haven't completely changed your module as you've approved it even before we get to part two. Um, and at this point, I'll hand back to Lydia and we'll go through the questions and answers. All right. Thanks very much. So I can read out some questions for you, Michael. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for the for the first session of our radio webinars. That was brilliant on the fly and everything. True professional. <laughs> um, um, so thank you all for joining us as well. I'll cover some questions just in a second. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention alongside the our radio capabilities here at Element, we also have um, a global market access team, which is worth um, letting you all know about now. We deal with a whole host of, of radio compliances around the globe <clears throat> alongside any safety and EMC requirements that come along with that. Um, one of the pros of using that service is that um, it's increased planning when it comes to um, global compliance leading to far fewer bumps in the road you know we we de-risk a lot of potential failures in terms of worldwide compliance with our global market access group um, we manage this entire process for you guys as well and with the help of people like Michael and um, my colleagues providing the other certifications it means that you guys aren't having to dealing with this uh, and having to deal with the stress of um, speaking to in-country certification bodies on different time zones and so if you do have questions regarding global market access as well then it's worth um, it's worth asking those now and um, equally we have a, a commercial inbox that you can send any inquiries to and um, so please if you could make note of the uh, email address I'm about to give you which is commercial.team at element.com uh, so if there's any questions that aren't answered today or if you have any inquiries for our, our services at all, then please feel free to forward them there. So I'll open up some questions now for you, Michael, if you just bear with me. Good. I mean, uh, obviously, the, the, the question we always get is, will I get a copy of this presentation? And the answer yeah. is yes. Um, <laughs> in, in fact, we had pre-recorded one just in case it all went horribly wrong. Um, I feel like the pre-recorded one was quite calm, so maybe that's the one to send. 
Yes, probably, yeah, we can get that across to people. Yeah, so I, I see a question here. If we have a device certified for use in the USA and Canada, should I see the FCC and IC marks on it? Yes, you should. Um, so regardless, if it's like if it's a radio module and the module manufacturer says, oh, it's a certified module, then yes, there should be FCC ID and IC number on the module itself. Or if the end product is certified, even if it contains a certified module, then there should be a certification number on it. And it should say FCC ID and then the number and IC and then the number. I've got one here for you, Michael. Um, do firmware updates to modules qualify as a change requiring reassessment? Yeah, now that's a really good question. So software and hardware reassessments, these are things they're known as permissive changes. And the concept here is if you've got a transmitter and it's operating in a certain way and you change it, then you've got to change. So if you change the transmitter hardware such that any of the transmitter hardware changes, in theory, that's a new certification. Or if you change the software or the firmware such that the transmitter power goes up, then that's a new certification. But there are some changes you can make that don't require a new certification, and they're known as permissive changes. Simply put, a change which is permitted within the certification. Now, from a hardware point of view, historically, any change to the transmitter components required a new certification, and any change to the transmitter hardware was not allowed under a permissive change. Permissive changes would only have been for the, the kind of, you know, memory chip or the power supply or something like that. However, we've had a component shortage issue um, and supply chain issue for the last few years. And so the FCC, Canada has always been more relaxed than the FCC on this topic. But in the last few years, the FCC put out an announcement saying, actually, if you are changing your product because you want to develop your product, then you need a new certification. If you've changed a component to a different component manufacturer or a slightly different type of component, even if you've had to slightly move something, if you can justify that you had to do that because the original components you were using were out of stock and you want to sell the same product, then you could do that as a class two permissive change. The question was obviously about firmware. So now we're asking, right, OK, what about my firmware? If you've changed the product like it's brought on a whole new type of transmitter, like it was cellular and magically it also now does Wi-Fi. Uh, that would be some pretty impressive firmware. Um, but let's say, you know, it was Wi-Fi and now it's uh, a, a frequency hopping Bluetooth, for example, or vice versa. Then that might need a new certification. Or if you've increased the power, that might need a new certification. But if you've just said, right, my firmware Actually, I've changed the bandwidth. So it was 20 megahertz channels. Now it does 40 megahertz channels. Or it was, you know, it was one type of modulation, but now it's a different type of modulation, but the power is not exceeded. Then you can do that through a permissive change. So it, the radio module could keep its own its existing certification, but it would just need an update to the certification. And there are two types of uh, permissive changes, class one or class two. Um, but FCC, there's class one or class two. Class one is a change that doesn't really have any effect. So if you change a component supplier and you test it and the results look the same as before, you'd call that a class one. Or you change the firmware and it makes no difference to the radio performance and you tested it and you know that, then it's a class one. But if you've tested it and gone, wow, okay, my emissions have gone up, then that's a class two. The FCC does have a class three, which is for software defined radio, which is quite a rare beast. And Canada is a class three permissive change for any uh, software related or firmware related change. Sorry, uh, I'm aware that we're short of time. So I'll, uh, um, what, any got next question? One. We've got another one here for you, Michael. Um, so what counts as being in other equipment? So this, this specific question says, what about a medical device? with a USB interface to a 5G dongle. Hmm. Uh, you know, would that lose certification unless it had modular approval? Right, so that's, that's a good question. Now, if you've got a laptop and you plug 
a USB dongle into the side of the laptop, you haven't magically installed the dongle into the laptop. Um, and so I don't know if he's talking about US, uh, USA or EU. So I'll try and be quite general. So the USA, um, in both cases, if it's a simple plug and play and the end user can plug it in and unplug it and it's all intended to work that way, that's not a modular approval issue. If it's permanently installed into the product at the time the product is placed on the market, then that becomes like a radio module. So let's say, for example, you had a medical unit and you took the cover off and you put a USB dongle into the USB port and then you close the lid and you screwed it down with screws and then you sell the medical equipment. Well, that that's a radio enabled medical equipment. And just because it was a USB dongle, um, it's still permanently installed at that point. Um, there's a lot uh, of questions. I'm happy to e email out some of these questions. We've got the list of all attendees, haven't we? Yes, yes, we can cover we can cover um, the questions as they come through. Um, we've got a few more minutes, so I will um, pose just a couple more. And then um, what we'll do, guys, is if there are outstanding questions um, relating to the subject as a whole, you know, Michael will will do everything he can to get back to you. Um, if you have questions relating to an inquiry or our capabilities in general in terms of EMC, safety, red testing, to that effect, um, then please contact the commercial dot team um, at element.com email that I mentioned previously. Because uh, I can just see some questions coming through about who can we speak to about points of contact, etc. Um, so one one of the questions we've got is: Are FCC, IC, and Red considered the gold standard, or are other markets more strict in their requirements? Oh, um, now this, yeah, it sort of leads into some of the the global market. Um, uh, certifications that I mentioned previously. There are certain territories that are, I would say, easier to sell into in terms of radio products and some that are much more difficult. Um, personally, in my experience, I've found that uh, radio certifications in India, for example, have been far more straightforward than others, potentially, you know, maybe Brazil or Mexico. Um, yeah, Michael, I don't know if you've had any experience with that that you can comment on. I, I noticed that you answered as with your expertise in global market access. So you're obviously thinking about the paperwork and the procedure and the process, the authorization. Um, yeah. I, I still have my test engineer head on. So for me, I thought, OK, well, FCC and, and the Radio Equipment Directive, obviously the Radio Equipment Directive in, involved. So the FCC is emissions and transmitter performance. And the radio equipment directive is emissions, radio performance, receiver performance, RF exposure, product safety. And, and I thought gold standard, though, but I want to be polite and say that doesn't mean that anybody's testing is more strict, for example, than Japan. So they have their own testing requirements. And it would be wrong of me to say that one country's testing is stricter or tougher because I, I haven't been involved. So I wouldn't. I'd be reluctant to use the term gold standard, but I would say that you can get to a lot of other markets with the USA and European test results and or certifications. So it doesn't necessarily mean they're the best, but I would say they're probably the most common. Yeah. Um, I've got another one here. So how do you know which declaration of conformity goes to which unit? So do you use date of release of the declaration of conformity in the unit or do you recommend indicating serial numbers on the declaration of conformity yeah that i i've often wondered how i would do that if i was a manufacturer i i would let, let's say you're selling radio modules and if you wanted to do the right thing let's say you're selling all these modules and then at, at serial number 500 for example the standards change so from serial number 501 onwards your doc has a new number on it and so if you have an online doc the sensible thing you would think would be you click on it and it says DOC serial numbers zero to 500 is there and then serial numbers 501 onwards it's here and a different standard on them from a legal point of view that makes perfect sense to me and I like that however I can also imagine lots of um, uh, module manufacturers would like 
to give the impression that even serial numbers 0 to 500 could meet that new standard. So I wouldn't be surprised if you would find an online DOC for that model number where the date of the DOC and the standard comes out applies effectively to modules that were placed on the market. And, and I'm not saying that's wrong because the module manufacturer might have reassessed that module without making any changes. So you could legally, or you know, from an engineer's point of view, you could say, okay, that module's been on the market for two years, but it still meets the new standard that came out last month. Um, but from a legal point of view, probably the serial numbers would make the most sense. Uh, oh, I just sorry. Um, question about oh, sorry Lydia did you have another one yeah. I've seen one come up that's um sort of pricked my ears because it's regarding uh, PTCRB certification uh -oh. um <laughs> I uh, unmute Luis Magana <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well the question was if if a if a device is PTCRB um certified yeah. and there was a need for a, a, a component change does that yeah. then require PTCRB recertification? That's a good question. I was hoping you were going to say what testing is involved if you put a PTCRB module into an end product, because I know the answer to that one. So <laughs> I don't know what the what uh, the rules are with making component changes to PTCRB approved products. So I will check with my conformance colleagues and get back to everybody on that one. Finally put you to the test. I think that's the first yeah. time. <laughs> I can't answer a question. It makes me feel good. <laughs> um, so um, was there a question that you saw, Michael, that you wanted to answer? Uh, only somebody had said uh, GPS receivers, um, uh, radio modules. So in the USA, radio receivers are requiring authorization, but there's two things. Firstly, receivers can't get a module approval and secondly gps is above the frequency where the receiver in usa and canada only receivers that tune between 30 megahertz and 960 megahertz only those receivers require authorization um, and so your end product for that type of receiver would need an authorization so but gps is above that so north america gps is exempt from authorization but gps receivers in the EU, of course, they're part of the radio equipment directive. There's a, a standard for them. They would be tested for radio, EMC, and safety. And so if you have a CE marked GPS receiver, then that's good. That's a CE marked receiver. And then when you install that receiver into your end product, you become the manufacturer of a GPS enabled radio equipment. And so your end product would meet would be in the scope of the raid and i and that actually matches a question i remember somebody once said, and this is why my eyes went to this one i remember a manufacturer once saying our product um we apply the emc directive and the low voltage directive and i said wow are those old things still being used so you've got no radio in your product and they went no none at all and when i was chatting to them i said it says here it knows where it is how does it know where it is they went oh it's got a gps module but it's only a receiver and we didn't make the module I was like, no, but that is a radio receiver. And so your end product is in scope of the red, not the EMC and low voltage directives. So GPS receiver module in your product. Yes, you are in scope of the red. All right, we're dead on five o'clock um, in the UK here, uh, Lydia. Uh, I really apologize to everybody for that little IT hiccup at the beginning. The recording will be nice and smooth, I'm sure. And I will make sure I go through these questions. And I look forward to seeing you all next week. If you haven't registered for next week, get your colouring pencils out, uh, get a pad of paper, and we'll we'll go we'll do some drawing. Thanks, Michael. And again, guys, if there are queries outstanding from this webinar, or if you have inquiries that you'd like to make with us, um, please feel free to use that commercial.team at element.com email. Equally, you can email myself, lydia.wilkinson at element.com. I work in our Connected Technologies business unit, so Michael and I work together quite regularly. And if there's anything you need from us, then um, just let either of us know.